Hello, everyone, and welcome to week two of Heschel, Human Rabbi and Radical. It is lovely having all of you join us, whether you're here at uh, 37 Southbourne or wherever you are around the globe, Thornhill, etc. <laughs> uh, we're going to do things not in order today. Um, that is to say, we're going to start on page 10 in the handout because there's stuff I really want to get to, and there's stuff that I just would generally really want you to have. Um, so we're to begin with is a prayer for peace. Uh, this Heschel uh, writes and reads uh, with respect to what's going on in Vietnam. Ours is an assembly of shock, contrition, and dismay. Go. Here, I'm uh, Enid, if I could put you in charge of handing out. Yes. That is, that is come. Who would have believed that we life-loving Americans are capable of bringing death and destruction to so many innocent people? We are startled to discover how unmerciful, how beastly we ourselves can be. So we implore you, our Father in heaven, help us to banish the beast from our hearts, the beast of cruelty, the beast of callousness. What are we feeling so far? Ooh. He's American. Yeah, he is. <laughs> he is then. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah he, he, he does become a citizen. And um, we'll see later on uh, in the next piece how his Americanness sort of comes out. Interesting. Uh, and I actually, I read an interesting piece today on the American flag in shuls and how different halachic authorities have viewed it, uh, which also, it's, it's, and it speaks to the, the Americanness of the, the writers of the different positions. Well, then you'll, you'll be interested, I suppose, for, for another day. That was a very big issue when I was uh, president because Rabbi Salzman was adamant that the flags had no place on the bima, and it's probably in line with the kinds of arguments that that you yeah some of the read. Of it, yeah or parts of them. Okay. And I, I don't disagree with them, by the way. Oh, really? <laughs> That's interesting. Think they should be there. No. Okay. Well, Confusion of state um, and, right. and religion, and, and uh, <laughs> it's a distraction from the notion. This is what I taught me yeah. anyway. It's a distraction from the. From the relationship with God, and and okay. that's what this is all about. But but most of the writers also said, like, if they're already there, yeah, just leave them. <laughs> well, they were, okay. which I think is a good eight. Well, but for me, they are. Yeah, yeah. but for you, they are. Okay. Since the beginning of history, evil has been going forth from nation to nation. The lords of the flocks issue proclamations, and the sheep of all nations indulge in devastation. Oh. Yeah, and, and and the rhyme. But who would have believed that our own nation, at the height of its career as the leader of free nations, the hope for peace in the world, whose unprecedented greatness was achieved through liberty and justice for all, should abdicate its wisdom, suppress its compassion, permit guns to become its symbols? Wow. Wow. Whoa. Wow. Rabbi, wow. Rabbi, yeah. Rabbi can I ask a question? Yeah. He wasn't ahead of um, you know, I didn't, I didn't bring down the book. Um, uh, I think this 67? is yeah. I think this is the insecurity of freedom. Uh, the book I can check when I yeah. later. Yeah. But um, what year was this written? I, I was just talking about. I I apologize. I forget. But I bet you, if someone at home, if you want to Google a prayer for peace, Heschel, you can figure it out for us. <laughs> They're all busy. Yeah. <laughs> Robbie. Okay. Yeah. Robbie. Thanks, Robbie. Okay. America's resources, moral and material, are immense. We have the means and know the ways of dispelling prejudice and lies, of overcoming poverty and disease. We have the capacity to lead the world in seeking to overcome international hostility. Must napalm stand in the way of our power to aid and to inspire the world? I feel like sobbing. So American. Yes. <laughs> right. And and who's he talking to? I was going to ask you that. Who's this, this for? for? Americans. Yeah. Right. This isn't a room full of rabbis. But this, but this isn't like the general population of America. I mean, who who's reading this? <laughs> Like-minded Jews. Right? Well, no. I mean, I I think this is. Uh, this is an ecumenical, interdenominational prayer. Oh. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I haven't read anything aside from Father in Heaven, which our Father in Heaven, by the way, doesn't sound particularly Jewish. Sure, sure. No, no. Right. And you'll see the next thing also. Um, 
he is very fluent in American and in Christian. Oh, okay. okay. That makes sense. Um, and so, I mean, I, I can, this is something which theoretically you could, I think, could see a pastor reading or okay. praying on a Sunday morning. Also, you know, a rabbi from the pulpit. He would have been a terrible congregational rabbi, by the way. Why? He had no patience. <laughs> and you need patience? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who knew? Pro yeah, prophets, yeah. I mean, and you know, he talked what, what we're not doing today because we just didn't have time. He he writes beautifully, maybe another time, about you know, in the book The Prophets about you know, who is a prophet. And you can't read that without also thinking like to what extent is he in his own mind, if at all, thinking of himself? Because you know, he people called him a prophet, I mean, to his face. And prophets do not make good rabbis. I'm sure. They make good it's, profits. It's interesting, Rabbi, as I read the material on the early part of the material you gave us, which talks about the, effectively the definition of a prophet, I was thinking maybe Rabbi is giving us a message that he's going he's gonna to start with fire and brimstone starting yeah. this week. Right. Oh, by the but, way, the, by the way, this is 1971. Okay, thank you. 1971. Um, you know, rabbis who preach fire and brimstone don't last very long. Uh, I have one friend who is his, um, yeah, I don't think it's exactly his, his speaking style, but if there is a sort of visionary, radical rabbi out there in the, in the Orthodox world, um, I would say it's him on social justice issues. He, tr he was a congregational rabbi for one year <laughs> his contract was probably longer than that i never asked it didn't work out and i know why he, he does very well what he's doing it's not in the pulpit world um is that because he talked be sure. about, does that because he talked about parking in the parking lot <laughs> i'm sure he spent his entire time speaking about the parking lot uh, he probably owns a car uh, i'm sure it is electric um to be sure just as we feel deeply the citizens dilemma we are equally sensitive to the dilemma confronting the leaders of our government hmm. our government seems to recognize the tragic error and futility of the escalation of our involvement but feels that we cannot extricate ourselves out of public embarrassment of such dimension as to cause damage to america's prestige but the mire in which we flounder threatens us, with an e threatens us with an even greater danger. It is the dilemma of either losing face or losing our soul. Can, can I say something? Yes, please. Um, this was written in 1971. Yes. And the way it's read today, it's like if it has been talking to today, today, what's going on. Mm-hmm. I actually, in the next piece, one of my questions was, you know, to what extent does this speak towards today? And I, part of the language of prophets is they're supposed to be timeless. So what does he mean? Who's who's losing face and who's losing our soul? The, the, I mean, Americans, the Americans, right? got the government, government, right? If, if the government pulls out of Vietnam, it's like, there, it's a recognition of error, error. I right? See. I see. I see. Okay. We, for those of you who are more recently joined, we are now on the bottom of page 10 uh, in the booklets. We did not start on page one. So, 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 and the losing our soul is if they stay. If they stay, exactly. Oh, they can't. Right. 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 Damned if they do, damned if they don't. Exactly. Uh, at this hour, Vietnam is our most urgent, our most disturbing religious problem. It's not keeping Shabbos. It's not Kashrut. It's not the bar mitzvah kids who never come back to shul. Vietnam is the most pressing religious problem. A challenge to the whole nation, as well as a challenge to every one of us as an individual. When a person is sick, in danger, or in misery, all religious duties recede. All rituals are suspended except one to save life and relieve pain and like from a from a halakhic point of view um you know certainly if you're sick and danger right you are in fact relieved you know, you're patur from mitzvah you don't have to do the religious duties uh 
misery is a little bit of a question. <laughs> um, but, wow. Vietnam is a personal problem. This is something he harkens back to again. Um, mm -hmm. And he certainly talks about, uses very similar language when he talks about what you know, he refers to and everyone refers to as the Negro problem. It's personal. It's not about you and me. It's not about them or our government, but you. To speak about God and remain silent on Vietnam is blasphemous. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are not clean. And I apologize. I did not look up. I was going to ask where it was from. Yeah. Robbie, you're on. Yeah. What? <laughs> I want to know where that's from. Top of page 11, where, what the quotation's from. In the sight of so many thousands of civilians and soldiers slain, injured, crippled, of bodies emaciated, of forests destroyed by fire, God confronts us with this question. Where are you? God confronts us. us. Yes. Not us saying to God, Correct. where are you? Which is another way of saying interesting. God That's in search of man. All right. Oh my goodness. That's cool. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ayaka, where are you? It's Amos. Where are you? Yeah. Cool. yeah he he, he like Amos. Amos is where he begins. Yeah. Like in, in the pro in the book, the prophets, it's yeah. the first prophet who he looks yeah. at. Um you could almost say, did God say that during the Holocaust too? Did we yes. ever hear that? Did anybody use yeah, that? So term? I mean, that the Holocaust is always, as I said last time, in the background somewhere. I mean, his his family's wiped out. Right. One of the one of the things I have in here is one of the few writings he has about the Holocaust. But if we get to it, it'll be at the end. But it would be a similar situation. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, is there no compassion in the world? No sense of discernment to realize that this is a war that refutes any conceivable justification of war. The sword is the pride of man. Arsenals, military bases, nuclear weapons lend supremacy to nations. War is the climax of ingenuity, the object of supreme dedication. Men slaughtering each other, cities battered into ruins. Such insanity has plunged many nations into an abyss of disgrace. Will America, America, the promise of peace to the world, fail to uphold its magnificent destiny? The most basic way in which all men may be divided is between those who believe that war is unnecessary and those who believe that war is inevitable. Wow. Between those to whom the sword is the symbol of honor and those to whom seeking to convert swords into plowshares is the only way to keep our civilization from disaster. Most of us prefer to disregard the dreadful deeds we do over there. The atrocities committed in our name are too horrible to be credible. It is beyond our power to react vividly to the ongoing nightmare, day after day, night after night. So we bear graciously after people's suffering. O oh Lord, we confess our sins. We are ashamed of the inadequacy of our anguish, of how faint and slight is our mercy. We are a generation that has lost the capacity for outrage. I like that, that, that line always said to me. A generation lost the capacity for outrage. We must continue to remind ourselves that in a free society, all are involved in what some are doing. Some are guilty. All are oh. responsible. Yeah. I think, uh, I think uh, Ellie Wiesel is also uh, noted as, as being the author of that uh, quotation. I'm not sure who said it first. As I mentioned, they, you know, they, they were friends. Rabbi, isn't that uh, a, a sentence? We are a generation that has lost the capacity for outrage with all the... Um, uh, the shootings going on in schools and all those places. I mean, yes. part of the, you know, sure. part of the people are outraged, but not enough to yeah. make changes. But then you have the people, sorry, I came in late, but it's still good. You have the, you have what you're talking about, the National Rifle Association, yeah. which goes like immoral because they're they're actually out there trying to shut down the outraged part of the population. Yeah. I mean, clearly, and they are in power. Mm. Uh, you know, well, it's a government which is elected. Yes, uh, I don't. I don't want to focus too much on 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 guns in the United States. But this is just you're talking about the states that we are a generation that has lost the capacity for outrage. 
but there are now a lot of people that are outraged like there there, there are and i think what one of the, what Heschel's trying to do here and and elsewhere uh is really he's trying to like he's trying to show people if you were dropping in like here here's a nice um way of thinking about it uh you're you're living here in the year 2023 uh, if you're suddenly teleported back to uh, 1650 and uh, you're dropped in Charleston, South Carolina, right, and you get to see slavery in action, the hope is it's a shock to your system and you're outraged, right? Uh, but of course, the people there are not shocked and outraged, almost anybody, aside from maybe the people who are enslaved, um, because it's it's normal. Right. And he's saying, you know, we live at a time like you, it's the frog in the boiling water, right? Mm -hmm. you, it, you, it, you're used to it, you're used to it, and you're not outraged. But if someone from 200 years from now comes to visit 2023, I'd like to think that there are things in our society that they're not outraged or at least really pissed off about. <laughs> right. I'd like to think that we are still moving, as, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, you know. Uh, the moral arc of the world is long, but it, uh, but it arcs for justice. I'm misquoting, but I'm close. <laughs> um, and that the, we will be seeing more justice and equity in 200 years than we see today. I hope. Uh, let's just turn the page, page 12. Is there some tie to this, though, to Jewish theology? I think that there is, and you'll see. So right now, he's going to paraphrase Isaiah. Okay. Um. For Vietnam, this is the, the italics. For Vietnam's sake, I will not keep silent. For America's sake, I will not rest until the vindication of humanity goes forth as brightness and peace for all men is a burning torch. Uh, and I will read you the Hebrew in one second. <clears throat> I have 62. Laman Sion lo echeshe, Laman Yerushalayim lo eshkot, Ad yetze chanoga tzid ka, Yeshuata kelapid ivar. For the sake of Zion, I will not be silent. For the sake of Jerusalem, I will not be still. Till her victory emerge resplendent and her triumph like a flaming torch. You know, so this is the ability to replace Zion with yeah. Vietnam and yeah, Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it, who does that? <laughs> Prophets do that. <laughs> but I didn't read then, um, and I can't remember his name. Daniel Bergstein, the one who took the, the documents. Yeah, the uh, first, yeah, yeah, it's clear, yeah. He was a. Um, wasn't the, he? Uh, the papers. Bernstein. 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 Thank you. So it, it Vietnam became a particularly religious issue for a lot of these people who you know led the protests who mm -hmm. mobilized people who wrote so you know it, it's interesting that's all yeah and uh, and there's a lot of really interesting things being written about um white christian nationalism and 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 talking about flags, flags in synagogues, and flags in churches, and worshiping of flags. Any others? Anyway, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there. If you're interested to read. Okay, so next thing we're going to look at. So, Rabbi, yeah. sorry. A different topic. Hold on, Danny first, and then Robbie. Okay. Okay. So, if he was around today, mm -hmm. where would he be? If he was in, if he was in Israel, he'd be leading the demonstrations of Israel night. I'm pretty sure. And if it was here or wherever, he would be speaking out against the uh, Israeli policy. And he would think it's an affront to to everything. It gets exactly what he's that same message. You do the same about Ukraine, would he not? Yeah. No, you'd be yeah. concerned about Israel only because it's us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Although in principle, <laughs> Ukraine is the same as Vietnam. Well, yeah. but but yeah. but but, yeah. Viet, but, but, but Viet, not yeah, America's but, not. It's not America. It's a right. It's a Russia's Russia. Russia. But, but it's. But that's what America America is not outraged enough to do something more uh, drastic than they're doing. You know, arguably, you know, arguably F-16s now. Robbie. 
Well, you may have talked about this in your opening session, which I unfortunately missed, but I mean, Heschel was a New Yorker, right? I mean, he was a New York philosopher, a Northeastern philosopher. And, and I, as I read the material, you'll forgive me, it, it struck me that the further away an issue was to him, the more engaged he was. In other words, he was engaged with the Blacks. Blacks was certainly not a New York issue. He was engaged in Vietnam, certainly not a Vietnam, a, a New York type issue. In other words, he was a humanist based in, in New York. Not necessarily- so I, I'm gonna disagree with you on the first. Okay. Um, you know, he lived on the border of Harlem. Uh, for, there was no way he wasn't aware and involved. And he also, like, he transplanted. I mean, he didn't go visit Vietnam, but he certainly spent a lot of time um, in areas with, you know, very large African-American populations. Rabbi? And, yes, Linda. Yeah, uh, having grown up in New York City and lived during the Vietnam War in New York, um, I think the use of uh, the word napalm in, in his prayer uh, is, is striking because that photo is very much in the forefront of newspapers. Also, um, I remember protests in the street and, and I think, you know- Columbia closed down. Yeah, exactly. Students shut and, down and, Columbia and he lived right there. And in fact, um, even, you know, when uh, uh, Robbie mentions uh, the black situation. New York had this huge thing with the teachers, the Jewish teachers in the black community. This is part of the culture in New York and, and the demonstration. And also rabbis in general, whether it was the civil rights movement or Vietnam, were calling on congregations in general. I remember listening to a sermon in my congregation where the rabbi called on people to fight for uh, the uh, civil rights movement to go south. Linda, which, which rabbi, which congregation? Rabbi uh, Gottlieb in uh, the Bronx. I'm a First Bronx. Edward? I'm a Bronx girl. Okay, I want names. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, but, the, uh, the, the history of Black Jewish relations is fascinating. There are some great material for another time, okay. um, in, including lots of material, uh, meeting notes from the, the Jewish teachers and in New York. And, and yeah, I'm just, I'm just saying that situation. I think the role of a rabbi very often mixes in with the civil unrest of whatever time we're living in, and not necessarily as a prophet, but as a leader. Yeah, I also okay. would like I would like to say something yeah, go very ahead. briefly about the what Robbie said about New York, where Robbie, I believe you said something like there was no problem with, with blacks in New York. No, this I didn't say that. I just said we I sometimes worry that we philosophize more than we do. Well, let me let me tell you that in the in the 60s and the early 70s. Uh, because I had mishpocha in New York. I visited New York frequently. And uh, the situation in Harlem, uh, Rabbi noted that uh, Heschel lived just on the outskirts or the edge close to Harlem. My, uh, my dear wife worked in Spanish Harlem uh, for almost a whole year. There were tenement houses in Harlem that were in dreadful conditions. And, and owned by no, Jews. <laughs> and they were owned by not only Jews, by rabbis. Yeah. It was a scandal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 1968, uh, organization, the Conference of Jews and Christians something, I don't remember the name, exactly the organization. Uh, and they put together uh, a conference, they put together a, a meeting, what have you. Uh, called Religion and Race, and they invite Heschel to make a presentation. Uh, this is page 13 in your booklet. It's, where it, it's long. Uh, I've made if those who are here, and I've given you a handout. Uh, it'll be a little bit easier to follow because I, I, I marked a few things off, um, but I'll, I'll be very clear where we are. So this is page 13. I love how he begins. 
At the first conference on religion and race, the main participants were Pharaoh and Moses. <laughs> I mean, you, you can't get better than that. <laughs> That's an opening. <laughs> Moses' words were, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may celebrate a feast to me. While Pharaoh retorted, who is the Lord that I should heed this voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I more and moreover, I will not let Israel go. The outcome of that summit meeting has not come to an end. Pharaoh is not ready to capitulate. The exodus began, but it's far from having been completed. In fact, it was easier for the children of Israel to cross the Red Sea than for a Negro to cross certain university campuses. Wow. You know, and of course, like this is also time of like liberation theology uh, popularizing within the Catholic Church um, and, and the idea and blacks look at themselves as being the Israelites who leave, who, who leave right. So this is going to be very, very resonant uh, in the Christian community. Um, so let's skip to the bottom of the page. Religion and race. How can the two be uttered together? To act in the spirit of religion is to unite what lies apart. To remember that humanity as a whole is God's beloved child. To act in the spirit of race is to sunder, to slash, to dismember the flesh of living humanity. Not a big fan of categorizing people into races. Uh, a big, couple paragraphs down. Perhaps this conference should have been called religion or race. You cannot worship God and at the same time look at man as if he were a horse. Because horses you can categorize into different breeds. Shortly before he died, Moses spoke to his people. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. I put before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life. All right. The aim of this conference is, first of all, to state clearly the stark alternatives. I call heaven and earth to witness again to this day. I set before you religion and race, life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life. Wow. So again, modifying a, a biblical verse, right? Adding in words to make it more meaningful to his audience. Uh, you know, quoting from... The Bible, which is, of course, the heritage of Jews and Christians and not a rabbinic teaching, right? As, as I had a Talmud teacher um, who he's referred to, hey, I understand he, he talked like this. <laughs> you don't, you know, you might not know all of Shas. That's, that, that's the entire Talmud. Yeah. But, the, but the Tanakh, it, it's just a small book. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and relatively speaking, he's right, you know. <laughs> well, we, we should have memorized Tanakh, you know. <laughs> like you know, all the Talmudic sages seem to have done. Um, a couple of paragraphs down. Faith in God is not simply an afterlife insurance policy. <laughs> right? And if you think about, um, what's it called? The, the, it's a classic a religious philosophical sort of problem. You know, you know, if there isn't God, you know, and I don't pray, nothing happens. If there isn't God and I do pray, I just waste a little time. If there is a God and I don't pray or worship whatever, you know, bad stuff happens. If there is a God and I worship, good stuff happens. So putting it all together, I may as well worship God, right? He's saying like, that's not the way we do things, right? Based on the, the existence of an actual interest. Um, <laughs> it starts with a P, I think. One of you will figure it out. Robbie! <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> uh, racial or religious bigotry must be recognized for what it is. Satanism. Blasphemy. Now, Satanism, like, if I'm a Jew in the audience, I'm like, Satanism? We don't talk like that. Right? Even blasphemy. We don't, like, we don't think in those. If you're a Jewish religious scholar, he says blasphemy, you, like, that actually might mean something to you. Right. If you're, if you're busy studying the tractate of Avoda Zara, like, OK, like maybe this has some resonance, but certainly Satanism. I see you, Claudette, like that. 
that as, as a Jew today, and I think as a Jew in 1968. Hmm? Yes, Claudette. I think what he's trying to do is to shock people into thinking and acting. Just like the oh, prophets sure. used to do. What the prophets used to do that with what they say that shock you, that you act and do 100%. something. 100%. Like we're going to see language about that within this very speech. Mm -hmm. um, we'll get, I hope we get there. Was we have 28 the, minutes. We'll get there. Was the ritual looking for paradigm? No. Not paradigm. No, no. The, the name of the person. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't okay. Know her name. Um, thank you, though. In several ways, man is set apart from all beings created in six days. The Bible does not say God created the plants or the animal. It says God created different kinds of plants, different kinds of animals. In striking contrast, it does not say God created different kinds of men, men of different colors and races. It proclaims God created a single man, one single man. From one single man, all men were des are descended. Now, there is a very famous uh, midrash uh, it comes up certainly in, in the Talmud, maybe elsewhere as well, that he is paraphrasing here. Um, and he clear, I mean, he's clearly using that, but he doesn't quote it, right? And when he publishes this, he doesn't footnote it. And I think that's part of his just interreligious framework. I'm trying to imagine how, if there was, say, uh, a book review in the New York Times on Sundays, how would this have been received? What would they say about this book? And who's the audience? The audience is America, again. Now, I think it's it's people who are interested in religion uh, you know, on, on some level, and, and certainly people who have a, a Bible-based religion. People who have a conscience. Yeah. So yeah, people have a conscience, but like, you know, if, if I'm secular, you know, if I'm if, if I'm an atheist, like parts of this, I hope will speak. You know, I think would speak to that person. Um, quoting from the Bible, you know, they're going to roll their eyes. Um, you know, but his audience there were Christians and Jews, which most of the time is a very awkward audience because Christians are Christian by religion, Jews are Jews by peoplehood, right? Most Jews in North America identify as Jews as a peoplehood more so than as a religion, right? So it's why Jews and Christians, it's a weird mix. Jews and ethno-national group, it's a much more natural uh, combination. But it's something that Christians don't understand about Jews by and large. Okay. Uh, to think of man in terms of white, black, or yellow is more than an error. It is an eye disease, a cancer of the soul. Okay. Um, and, and of course, you know, when I'm speaking, by the way, like, you know, I, I share ideas and I don't footnote everything, but right? I'll, I'll usually say the midrash, but like no one really cares what Duff it is in the, in the Gemara that I'm quoting from. Someone asks me afterwards, I might tell them, and I usually in my own sermons, I'll put it in so I have it for later, right? So I remember what I was quoting from. Uh, there is a, a rabbi who I will not name, who at some point in his career got into a little bit of trouble because he had published some sermons. And I don't, I don't think it was so much the Talmud quotations, but like quotations of other rabbis that were unattributed. Mm -hmm. Now, and his claim is that, you know, when they were put out there on, on the internet, wherever they were published, you know, he just didn't remember that he was quoting someone else because the way that he sort of kept his notes wasn't so ordered. Um, I can see that happening. I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, anyway. Yes, and 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 we have uh, had a number of uh, court cases uh, dealing with uh, stealing music, uh, I, I, not even melodies, but chord sequences. Yeah, you know, a, that, uh, that's all that, for me. That's all silliness to the some of these lawsuits. Um, Joe Rabbi, you stroked out these three paragraphs just following the one you just read, and actually they're they're relatively impactful because he's talking. He's, I know it's so hard. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I had the time to read it. Yeah. Um, but but what's sort of interesting is he's shifted now to this issue about uh, Black America, and and 
the, his his notion that we should be sort of colorblind um, about people and who they are. Um, anyway, I found those paragraphs just for the for the paragraphs maybe worth a moment to take a look at. Please, you know, read everything <laughs> and, and buy all his books and read them too. And tell me what you think. Um, um, but read his poetry last because yeah. not as good. Um, <laughs> the conference should dedicate itself not only to the problem of the Negro. This is um, a few paragraphs down, as Eric said, um, but also to the problem of the white man. Not only to the plight of the colored, but also the situation of the white people, to cure of a disease affecting the spiritual substance and condition of every one of us. What we need is an NAA, it's our NAAAP, a national association for the advancement of all people. Prayer and prejudice cannot dwell in the same heart. Worship without compassion is worse than self deception. It is an abomination. Now, when I read this, I couldn't help but think of all lives matter. Yeah. Yes. yeah right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. And you know, of course, like, like I, I think people say all lives matter, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're good people, like, because, the, and they're right, all lives do matter. Um, uh, but, you know, yes. failure to folk, but right. failure to point out the problem right. will never lead you to a solution, right. right? You have to be specific. And this particular person's lives matter, right? And, that, and that's actually, that's very shelly. It's, it's not that ma lives matter generally. It's that your life matters and your life matters. Every person's life individually matters. Um, now, I don't know how this was received, right? I'm curious. I, I'd be curious to know yes. also. Um, you know, I, I didn't go into the, the microfiche, as they say, and, and, and look at the newspapers for the next day. Uh, I, I imagine they would have said nice things about him. What just. about his colleagues and they said in the sem in this University. University. Really good yeah. question. Good question. What do they have to say about this? Yeah. So first of all, it, it's 1968. So there are 71. Yeah. Well, no, no. This is 68. 68. Last one was oh, 71. Yeah. Sorry, the last one. I apologize. Yeah. So first, it's important to remember Jews are still involved in um, what becomes known as not really even yet known as Black liberation. They're involved in NAACP. Uh, and and welcomed and, and certainly Heschel, you know, he, he has a lot of street cred because of his very close relationship with Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so it's it's really only later that first of all there becomes more animosity between uh, blacks and Jews, and of course I want to recognize that there are black Jews and there were black Jews, um, and and Jews who are not black are. are are really are pushed out of positions of leadership and influence in, in many different uh, black organizations in the United States. Uh, but we're not there yet. This is 68. This is still sort of early in, the, in, mm -hmm. in this process. Um, uh, that's the problem quick, is not only how to do justice to the colored people, it is also how to stop the profanation of God's name by dishonoring the Negro's name. 100 uh, years ago, the emancipation was proclaimed. It is time for the white man to strive for self-emancipation, to set himself free of bigotry, to stop being a slave to wholesale contempt, a passive recipient of slander. And like, yeah, like it's not disagreeable, but you know, if someone was saying this today, I think they would phrase it differently. Uh, so page eight, uh, now page 15, left-hand side, uh, three paragraphs in the bottom. The crime of murder is tangible and punishable by law. The sin of insult is imponderable, invisible. When blood is shed, human eyes see red. When a heart is crushed, it is only God who shares the pain. In the Hebrew language, one word denotes both crimes. Bloodshed in Hebrew is the same that denotes both murder and humiliation. And again, here he could have quoted quoted from a number of rabbinic sources, uh, and he doesn't. And I, I'm not opposed to that. Like, you know, again, when I speak, I don't necessarily like, because it's that's not how you preach. Um, but there's no footnote either in the published version. Uh, the law demands one should rather be killed than commit murder. Piety demands one should rather commit suicide than offend the person publicly. It is better, the Talmud insists, and here he does say the Talmud, 
to throw oneself alive into a burning furnace and to humiliate a human being publicly. Really? Wow. Is, is that... No, it, it, no. I mean, it's not... I don't mean literally, but... It, I yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I could find the... Notionally. Yeah, but it, it, it's, it's very clear that... Um, it's if you do the following things, kilu shofech damim, as if you have killed someone. But, now you're not really supposed to like kill yourself in order to no. I, I, I never take it literally. Yeah. <laughs> but but are, is it written also that you're supposed to kill a person who wants to kill you? Yes, there are, there are three. Um, yeah, so it's first that, that, that that's something else. There, there, yes. there are three things you're allow, you're supposed to allow yourself to be killed for, killed rather than commit. Um, but you have a positive obligation to kill a rodef, someone who is a pursuer, yeah. uh, which, by the way, is um, was one of the justifications that uh, Yigal Amir used in killing yes. Rabin, okay. right? Okay. Uh, he is in some level a rodef, and he therefore have an obligation to kill a rodef. And I spoke to Haredim, who agreed with that. Okay. Isn't it? Almost killed my uncle. It seriously gave him a heart attack. So that's why I know all about it. <laughs> uh, he who commits a major sin may repent and be forgiven, but he who offends a person publicly will have no share in the life to come. So how is it? So so the concept of not humiliating someone is is very high level in terms of how Jews are supposed to interact with each other. Yes. Okay. Yes, um, and I think it, when when you look at the Talmud, there are like in any religion, you know, the the legal pieces, and then you things you're supposed to aspire to, right? And there are those who really focus on aspiring to certain things, but it doesn't get put into law codes because like no one can actually live like that, and you can't create laws that no one can like function with, right? Like the like the Chafetz Chaim and and Safan um, Lashon Hara. Right. Like it's it's very late in terms of Jewish history and writing, right? He's 19th century. Um actually he may have even live into the 20th century. Robbie, <laughs> <Yes. Tzayin. laughs> he did live into the 20th century. Yeah, he, did. Right. he did. He did. Because I know my my great uncle, who I've mentioned uh, once or twice, um, he 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 met and learned about time. So I, I think it must have been the 20th century. Um now, here's someone who goes out his way to write about the laws of Lashon Hara in such a way that I mean I don't think anyone, including him, could ever have possibly followed all those rules. But no one writes about this earlier because I mean in in, in detail. The Prophet Chaim passed away in 1933. There you go. Um, it's late because you can't live a life in the way the Chafetz Chaim you know says. It's something you aspire to. But Lashon Hara is a, a high standard. I mean, it's we, we it's included in the list of the sins on Yom Kippur. And it you know idle gossip. Yeah. Right, but what but what specifies idle gossip? Right. Well, right. we know speaking know. badly of other people behind them. Did you hear about so and so? that? I think that's a very low level we can agree right. to. But like giving out examples and like detailing and the, the way the Chafetz Chaim does. I see. And he's very limited. Like he, he says, you basically can't say anything about anybody anytime. Um, Probably. Like reading the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> but even like, you know who I ran in today? And they said the nicest thing about you. You can't do that. Well, maybe we should make a rule in the shul. That's the way it is. For another time. Yeah. Only because we only, we only have an hour and I don't want to, yeah. and we have so much to learn. Okay, uh, page 90. Um, that is a page 16 on the left. <laughs> I know, I, I said top left corner and it did top right corner. Okay. Okay, okay not the word. Page 16. Yeah, yeah. The page uh, on, the, on the, the bottom. And 90, yeah. 90 in the photocopy but, okay. so on so on the left hand side um where underneath where it has number two the word proclaims so christian right the word we never talk about. love thy neighbor 
So we make it impossible for him to be a neighbor. Let a Negro move into our neighborhood and madness overtakes the residents. Mm. To quote an editorial in the Christian century, like from six years before, he's reading the Christian century? <laughs> like the quote itself is only sort of interesting, but like, <laughs> he reads it. Um, okay, the right side of the page, number three. To some Americans, the situation of the Negro, for all its stains and spots, seems fair and trim. So many revolutionary changes have taken place in the field of civil rights. So many deeds of charity are being done. So much decency radiates day and night. Our standards are modest. Our sense of injustice, tolerable, timid. Our moral indignation, impermanent. Yet human violence is interminable, unbearable, permanent. The conscience builds its confines, is subject to fatigue, longs for comfort. Yet those who are hurt, and he who inhabits eternity, neither slumber nor sleep. Right, and this so that's straight out of Psalm 110. Uh, most of us are content to delegate the problem to the courts as if justice were a matter for professionals or specialists. But to do justice is what God demands of every man. It is the supreme commandment, the supreme commandment, and one that cannot be fulfilled vicariously. Righteousness must dwell not only in the places where justice is judiciously, is judicially administered. I, I think it's a wonderful phrase, right? It's, it's upon all of us. Can't just say, oh, the courts will take care. Um, in a sense, this is the very bottom of the page. The calling of the prophet may be described as that of an advocate or champion, speaking for those who are too weak to plead their own cause. Indeed, the major the major activity of the prophets uh, was interference, remonstrating about wrongs inflicted on other people, meddling in affairs which were seemingly neither their concern nor their responsibility. Hmm. Um, and, and he, he's right. And, and if we had the part that we didn't not, not do in today um, is really the first chapter of the prophets, where he talks about you know, who who were the prophets, what is a prophet. Uh, maybe we'll get back to another time because uh, some it's, it's very again very shelly in his language. Uh, uh, source number five here, on the same page, a couple lines in, and difference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. It is more universal, more contagious, more dangerous. A silent justification, it makes possible an evil erupting as an exception, becoming the rule and being in turn accepted. The prophet's contribution to humanity was the discovery of the evil of indifference. One may be decent and sinister, pious and sinful. Not bad. Mm -hmm. 2023. Yep. And feel free to jump in if like any of this jumps out to you. You want to say something. Okay. Isn't, isn't this right here? Sorry, like Jesus. He's, the major activity of the prophets was the interference, remonstrating about wrongs inflicted on other people. It sounds very Christian. Like that was Jesus did with the uh I mean, for Christians, Jesus is a kind of prophet. Absolutely. So, I mean, he's, it he's depends which denomination you are and how you see Jesus as being a, a, a part of God rather than a prophet. But yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. I think Christians could read this and see Jesus. Yeah. I think Jews read this and hear uh, Isaiah. Mm -hmm. um, very bottom. In condemning the clergyman who joined Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., in protesting against local statutes and practices which denied constitutional liberties to groups of citizens on account of race, a white preacher declared, the job of the minister is to lead the souls of men to God, not to bring about confusion by getting tangled up in transitory social problems. Yeah. Now, I don't know if he, this is actually a direct quotation from anybody. Um, I haven't found that sermon published online. Uh, in contrast to this definition, the prophets passionately proclaim that God himself is concerned with transitory social problems, with the blights of society, with the affairs of the marketplace. What is the essence of being a prophet? A prophet is a person who holds God and men in one thought at one time at all times. Our tragedy begins with the segregation of God, the bifurcation of the secular and sacred. 
we worry more about the purity of dogma than about the integrity of love. Now, Jews don't speak about love a lot. Christians do. Jews should speak about love more. Vahavna et Hashem elokecha, right? It's a very, you know, the very first paragraph of the Shema. Um, we think of God in the past tense and refuse to realize that God is always present and never, never past. That God may be more intimately present in slums than in mansions with those who are smarting under the abuse of the callous. There are, of course, many among us whose record in dealing with the Negroes and other minority groups is unspotted. However, an honest estimation of the moral state of our society will disclose, and this should sound familiar to you, some are guilty, but all are responsible. Right. Right? It's our afraid. It works for Vietnam. It works for uh, the Negro problem. I did air quotes in case you missed it. Um, and he's right. Uh, and like I had said last week, he he quotes from himself. He paraphrases himself. You know, there's a you read all his books. And you're like, which book am I in right now? Uh, and that's not to say he isn't consistent to some extent. He is. I mean, and the books each do have their own arc. But you know, you can. They're all Heschel. They're all Heschel. Um. That equality is a good thing, a fine goal, this is the bottom of 17, may be generally accepted. What is lacking is a sense of the monstrosity of inequality, right? This is the outrage, right? Mm -hmm. Seen from the perspective of prophetic faith, the predicament of justice is the predicament of God. Of course, more and more people are becoming aware of the Negro problem, but they fail to grasp if it's being a personal problem. This sounds familiar, you know. People are increasingly fearful of social tension and disturbance. However, so long as our society is more concerned to prevent racial, racial strife than prevent humiliation at the cause of strife, its moral status will be depressing indeed. So what was what was the Negro problem that he was talking about specifically? Uh, so he he does speak earlier about just the, the how many uh, African Americans are living in slums. A concentration in you know the inner cities of like five particular places I see. You know, social advancement education uh just the plight of the black community yeah he was right. talking about the things that martin luther um um yeah. was talking about absolutely mm -hmm. yeah interesting quite a... um papa 95 and he and he introduces um martin luther king at least twice spoke to the rabbinical assembly convention uh, it used to be always held uh, at the Biltmore in the Catskills. Um, and so Heschel invited them and introduced them. So like you know, there, there was real connection there. And then Heschel, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. brought Heschel along too. Uh, and that was really important. Um, and it, 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 I just want to put it out there. And I, I, this is really to sound terrible. And I have no way am I trying to equate myself with any of the people we've been talking about. It just happens to be right before I came here uh, through a friend of mine. I've been in touch with um, the, the prime minister's advisor on in, in the PMO on indigenous affairs. And I said, I emailed her and I said, um, she might be Jewish. I'm not sure. Uh, based on her name. Like, you know, Sija usually sort of represents the community on community matters. I think that there is a spiritual piece in our relationships with indigenous nations that are that's missing. If you ever need a rabbi, you know, feel free to call. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that there there's a lot of important work yet to be done, Jewish, whatever relations, especially on the indigenous relations. And I think that rabbis, qua rabbis, and not just as community leaders. Uh, have a particular role to play. Uh, you don't live so in a vacuum. I'm sure she's very busy. Among people. What was that, Claudette? I said, we don't live in a vacuum as Jews. We live among people. So we... Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's no... Top of page 18 on the right. There is no insight more disclosing. God is one and humanity is one. There is no possibility more frightening. God's name may be desecrated. God is every man's pedigree. He is either the father of all men or of no man. Mm -hmm. and of course, 
he's he you know we don't speak with man language anymore today and men but we know what he means the image of god is either in every man or in no man uh i just want to make sure okay so that's uh, oh, no, he wasn't writing man as gender he was just writing yeah, yeah he's writing humanity everybody right. it was of course uh 19 right side um oh Sorry, left, left side, there's a couple sentences. Uh, so page, now we're on page 19 on the left side, fourth paragraph on the bottom. What we need is a total mobilization of heart, intelligence, and wealth for the purpose of love and justice. God is in search of man, waiting, hoping for man to do his will. That's from his book. Pardon? That's from his book. Yeah, so he titles the book God in Search of Man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now I must right tell side. you that when I first came to Adak, Israel, and I was studying, Rabbi Saltzman gave me a list of books that I should purchase, and of them, I purchased three of his books. But Dan, and I wish I, every congregant was like you. Yeah. Rabbi, what book should I be reading? <laughs> Let me tell you what books you should be reading. I, we have one and a half minutes left. On the right side, requires a breakthrough, a leap of action. I don't know if he coins the phrase, but he certainly uses it, right? It's supposed to cure her guard's leap of faith, a leap of action. Mm -hmm. It is the deed that will purify the heart. Um, and there, there's a whole Christian theology thing going on here, which I'm not going to get into. Uh, it is the deed that will sanctify the mind, right? Are you saved by, by belief alone or do you need action? Um, the deed is the test, the trial, and the risk. The plight of the Negro must become our most important concern. Our most important concern. Like Vietnam was the most important concern. The Negroes, right? <laughs> At that moment, like this is the thing. Seen in the light of our religious tradition, the Negro problem is God's gift to America. That language is obviously problematic. Yes. The test of our integrity, a magnificent spiritual opportunity. Now, to, the idea of like someone else exists for your spiritual growth, like really problematic and you, you hear this all the time still today you know why, why does god create people with disabilities so that we learn how to be compassionate well like ugh, that's not a theology that really has no. much appeal no. it, people say it all the time do they i, know. I never i've never heard that. i'm glad that you haven't yeah. maybe it's, it, it gets that maybe. um a little lower down uh, like you have to think of uh, high holiday liturgy here Life is clay in righteousness, the mold in which God wants history to be shaped. But human beings, instead of passion, they clay to form the shape. Um, there are those who maintain that the situation is too grave for us to do much about it, that whatever we might do would be, quote, too little and too late. But the most practical thing we can do is to weep and to despair. If such a message is true, then God has spoken in vain. Almost done. Such a message is 4,000 years too late. Uh, it is good Babylonian theology. And he talks about that earlier. In the meantime, certain things have happened. Abraham, Moses, the prophets, the Christian gospel. You know, someone even as ecumenical as Rabbi Jonathan Sachs would never utter this sentence, you know, including the Christian God. To give credence to someone else's um, Bible, it, it's not without its problems. Um, and, and then another famous line will end here, and you can read the last section by yourselves so that I've marked off again on, on the right side in 20. Uh, so this is uh, four or five paragraphs from the top on the left side. Paragraph starts, it is not, and we're a few sentences in, we are all pharaohs or slaves of pharaoh. It is sad to be a slave of pharaoh. It is horrible to be a pharaoh. <laughs> 